Oh, hello there. My name is Sean McAfee. An American tech mogul at the center of an international murder mystery. American internet tycoon John McAfee is believed to be hiding in Belize after the murder of his neighbor. John McAfee, he built a fortune creating the antivirus software that protects millions of computers around the world. But now he's being chased by police across a tiny country in Central America. He's been running for almost a month, tweeting and blogging along the way. He's nuts. Government corruption, terrorists, poisoned dogs, a murdered neighbor, a body double, and that's not even the half of it. He was talking about taking over the country. I started to think, this guy is a madman. Then there was the gang of convicted criminals McAfee proudly says he hired as his armed bodyguards, his own private militia. He told me repeatedly that he could have people hurt, taken out, if he wanted to. Everybody I hired was an ex-felon and had spent half of their life in prison. It sounds like that's a recipe for disaster. Are you a madman? Are you paranoid? Are you an entrepreneur? All of the above. I do have teenage girlfriends, and many at a time. Nothing illegal. Did these women really try to kill me? <laughs> well, not all of them, of course. In fact, fewer than 50% tried to kill me. Zero to crazy in like two seconds. It's always there, it's watching. 15 years ago, I had some beautiful software and they took it over. I don't know what they did, it was like, the time I hired that Bangkok prostitute to do my taxes while I fucked my accountant. So is McAfee a successful entrepreneur who went mad <laughs> and killed his neighbor? Or is he the potential savior of America? John McAfee has been described as many things. Eccentric tech millionaire, international fugitive, presidential candidate, and suspected murderer. Honestly, John McAfee's life is one of the most fascinating and bizarre stories I've ever heard, and opinion is split on whether he was a hero or the devil. You see, John McAfee was once hailed as a pioneer in cybersecurity, but his life then took a series of dark and crazy turns and became a complex web of paranoia and controversy. This is the tale of a man who embodied both genius and madness. A millionaire willing to break any laws he wanted. And I promise you this, the deeper down this rabbit hole we go, the crazier things will get, as every layer we peel back reveals an even darker mystery. It's time to step into the insane world of John McAfee. John McAfee was born in 1945 and grew up in an unstable home where his alcoholic father would physically abuse him and his mother. And when John was just 15 years old, his father took his own life. John was left traumatized and went off to college to study mathematics, hoping for a fresh start. But this is where his own heavy drinking and drug use began. As a broke college student, John needed a way to make money to fund his expensive addictions. And so John started his first small business selling magazines, which helped him develop his skills as a salesman. However, John soon realized he could make a lot more money if he was willing to break the law. And so he decided to start selling a different product, cocaine. I used to sell drugs because if you take enough drugs, the only way you can support your habit is to sell to others. So. Um, and, and for many years I did. Despite the drink and drugs, John learned the basics of early computer programming, which helped him land a job after college as a programmer at NASA's Institute for Space Studies, where he worked on the Apollo program. He then moved to Silicon Valley, where his computer skills were in extremely high demand, which allowed him to get several prestigious programming jobs at places like Lockheed and Xerox. However, John often found corporate life very dull, and so he continued using all kinds of drugs, and even took LSD in the mornings on his way to work. At one job, his daily routine consisted of drinking a bottle of scotch and doing coke at his desk, although he was eventually caught and fired. There was also another job where he took the psychedelic drug DMT in to work with him. He tried just a small amount at first, but he didn't feel anything, so he decided to take the entire bag. As a result, he was tripping so badly that he no longer knew what the function of his job was, and he fled the office and hid behind a trash can. Needless to say, he got fired from that job too. 
Luckily though, all of that soon wouldn't matter, as John had a new business idea of his own. In 1986, the first computer virus to affect IBM personal computers was discovered. It was called Brain, and after looking into the virus, John quickly came up with a code that could stop it from infecting the target computer. I was reading and thinking, what the heck is this? And then it came to me, oh, I know what they did. I got some code that really replicates itself. And as soon as I got that, I got, you know what, that's easy to fix. I wrote a little program, and that was the beginning of my video. It only took John a day and a half to come up with the antivirus software, but that one day's work would soon change his life forever. At the time, very few people had even heard of a computer virus. You really had to be a computer programmer to even care about it. But John McAfee saw the potential for this to be a high demand, regular consumer product. If people learned what computer viruses were, they would become afraid of those threats. And once they were afraid, they would surely want to protect themselves by buying the cure. So in 1987, John founded a business called McAfee Associates and began selling his product called Virus Scan. He would start customers on a free trial of the product and then charge companies to use the full version. However, John needed to bring more attention to computer viruses in order to sell more of his product. So he arranged to be interviewed on news stations to talk about it. And this is where John's salesman skills really paid off. John used fear tactics to make people believe if they didn't download his antivirus software, it could mean losing all of the information on their computers. I see infections of small companies where every computer has become infected and the company is near collapse from financial loss. This was enough to convince businesses that they needed to prepare for these potential threats. By 1992, more than half of Fortune 100 companies had McAfee antivirus software on their computers, and John was making millions of dollars in licensing. And later that year, John would get an even bigger opportunity to profit from fear. One of the first big viruses to get a lot of mainstream media attention was dubbed Michelangelo. This was a virus that was said to be lying dormant in computers and that it would wake up on March 6th, Michelangelo's birthday, and overwrite all your data. This was the perfect virus to create a panic, because until March 6th, you would have no idea if you were infected. So John went on the news claiming that as many as 5 million computers could already be affected by the virus, but they just didn't know it yet. This is the number one virus. It is the number one computer threat. It's real and it's going to happen on the 6th of March. And thus, people began to panic buy his antivirus software to protect themselves. However, once March 6th rolled around, it turns out that only 10,000 to 20,000 computers were actually affected. Sales of McAfee software had skyrocketed though, and many people accused John of exaggerating the virus's impact in order to sell more copies of his antivirus program. But either way, by 1993, he owned 67% of the antivirus market. The company was bringing in millions of dollars in annual revenue, and yet John only had 20 employees. And instead of looking for qualified professionals, John would simply hire people he liked. He would keep them in the office for days at a time, with them sleeping at their desks. A former employee of the company said the work environment was borderline cult-like, because the employees were willing to do almost anything John asked. They had a, a group called Little Foxes, where they um, would give points for uh, having sex in different spots of the office. It's fair to say it wasn't your typical company. And yet, because their antivirus software was in such high demand, they were making a lot of money. And when John took the company public on the stock market, it brought his net worth up to $80 million. But now that the company was publicly traded, investors began to have a say in how things were run. They wanted to make the company into a much larger and more professional corporation. Of course, John did not want that. So, less than two years after the IPO, John sold his shares of the company for $100 million and separated himself completely from the business he had started. And this is where things started to get crazy. Now that John had left his antivirus company, he was a multi-millionaire and had enough money to never work another day in his life. But having all of this wealth made John paranoid. He began to carry a gun with him everywhere, and he was still taking lots of drugs, which only enhanced his constant paranoia. 
All of this led John towards more spiritual pursuits. In the year 2000, he bought nearly 300 acres of land in Colorado and opened a yoga and meditation center, and then invited yoga students to come stay at this home for free. John then went on to write several books about yoga, and soon dozens of students flocked to his yoga center claiming that they were captivated by his personality. Rumors began to spread that John was actually running a cult. It was during this time that John became obsessed with a new hobby that he called aero trekking, which is where you fly an ultralight aircraft low to the ground over rugged terrain, which is extremely dangerous. But John thrived on doing dangerous things. He soon began creating websites and ads to get other people interested in aero trekking, and he even started a company that offered aero trekking flights across the New Mexico desert. However, this ended in tragedy. You see, John trained his 22 year old nephew to be one of the pilots. But in 2006, his nephew crashed his plane into a remote canyon in Arizona and was killed. There was also a passenger on board named Robert who died as well. And since John owned the aero trekking company, Robert's family wanted to sue John for $5 million in a wrongful death lawsuit. Now, at this point, paying $5 million would have been very doable for John. But of course, he certainly didn't want to pay. And in truth, this wasn't the first lawsuit someone had filed against him. John believed that his wealth made him a target. So instead of facing the courts, John decided to flee to the country of Belize, where his lawsuits in the United States would no longer be valid. Before he left, John made a big show of selling his assets, including his Colorado yoga retreat. He invited news crews to broadcast the auction of his aeroplanes, boats, and estate, and he told the reporters that he had lost most of his fortune. He was basically trying to convince the world he was going broke. It was only in later years John admitted that was a lie, and he was just trying to stop people suing him. It's nobody's business. So the numbers that I throw out are numbers that I just randomly feel like throwing out. If the number four looks good today, I'll say I'm worth four million. Yeah, it's meaningless. I believe nothing I say when it comes to my work. John moved to Belize and had the opportunity to retire and settle down in a tropical paradise. He considered it the perfect society, as if you had enough money in Belize, you could buy anything or anyone who you wanted. And one of the first things John did was buy guns and computers for the local police, presumably to get them on side. John then spent the first few months snorkeling and relaxing on the beach with the many different girls he was simultaneously dating. However, John was always looking for his next business venture. And that would begin when he met a microbiologist from Harvard named Alison Adonisio. Alison was visiting Belize because she had heard about local healers using plant medicine. These plants contained a chemical which stops bacteria from spreading, and Alison was hoping to make a herbal antibiotic out of these plants. When Alison met John in Belize, he loved the idea, and offered to set up a lab in the middle of the Belize jungle for them to work on creating these plant-based antibiotics. It was such an exciting opportunity that Alison left behind her life in America and moved to Belize. However, very soon after the project began, John started inviting press to come to Belize to see the lab. Except this was too soon. Alison had nothing to show them yet. So John instructed her to put water with colored dye in beakers to make it appear as though they were making progress on some revolutionary new drug, even though they hadn't done anything yet. But John believed the media attention would help get more investors. Meanwhile, John hired over 100 locals to build a huge house for him. And at first, the Belizean locals absolutely loved John, because he paid $45 per day even though the average was just $25. However, it soon became clear that John was gaining more and more control over the local community. John started hiring bodyguards with criminal records, who were armed with guns and wearing sunglasses and camouflage uniforms like they were in the military. John called them his hitmen, and they were basically his own private army. Everybody I hired was an ex-felon and had spent half of their life in prison. John then began setting an 8pm curfew for the local village of Carmelita. By 9pm, his group of bodyguards would drive through the town, checking for anyone who disobeyed him. Now, John claimed he was doing this to clean up the town, which was rampant with crime. But he never explained what he was doing, and many locals were left terrified as well as the tourists who would unknowingly be walking on the beaches at night, only to see John walking the streets with a gun and armed guards. 
it felt like John had basically taken over the small village of Carmelita. John also had several vicious guard dogs that would roam freely on the beach, and there were multiple incidents of the dogs biting and attacking people. The neighbours would try to report these attacks to the police, but no official action was ever taken. Many locals suspected this was due to the police being paid off by John, as John had built them a police station and supplied them with weapons. Allison eventually decided that this was all too much for her. He talked about taking over the Belizean government. He would talk about his hitmen, he would talk about how he could have people hurt or killed, and um, you know, honestly, I was I was scared. So Allison confronted John about wanting to go home and abandon their jungle lab project. According to Allison, during this conversation, she said she had a headache. So John gave her two pills and a cup of orange juice. Soon after, Alison passed out. This is the next thing she remembers. He was standing over me, naked. And I woke up the next morning, and I was sick. I was dry heaving, and I was dizzy, and I grabbed my clothes. I don't even remember taking them off. Alison claims John drugged and assaulted her, and when she returned to the United States, she immediately contacted the authorities. However, the US authorities had no jurisdiction in Belize, so the case never went any further. And John denies her story entirely. Alison Adonicio, a mad woman. Well, she can claim whatever she likes. Never had sex with her, certainly never raped her. She seemed rational. She was not. As for the lab they'd been running in the jungle, that would eventually get raided by Belizean authorities over suspicion John had been making meth there. They did find several chemicals they couldn't even identify, but nothing illegal, and no charges were filed. However, things would soon get darker, when John McAfee would find himself accused of murder. John was paranoid of anyone trying to rob or kill him, which is why he paid for so much protection. I have an officer living on my compound. It makes me feel safe. It makes me feel safer to know that all the criminals that might want to rob me know there's a policeman living there. Yet somehow, despite all of this security, someone managed to break into John's house and steal from him. Word spread around the local community, and John heard that the robbery was committed by a man named David Middleton. Instead of reporting it to the police, it's alleged that John paid a group of men thousands of dollars to kidnap David from his home and make an example of him. One morning, John McAfee called me and he said, I need to chastise this guy to teach him a little respect. So John asked me if I could bring three guys up here, three bad, mean ass looking guy, to slap him up a little and tell him, be careful. It's claimed they beat and tased David, then dropped him off in the middle of the street in front of multiple witnesses. David went to the hospital, but the beating had been so brutal that he slipped into a coma and died a few days later. Even though it was widely believed John was behind the attack, the police did nothing. However, pretty soon after, one of John's neighbours, an American named Greg Fall, wanted to try and stand up to John. Greg had come to Belize for a peaceful retirement, and he hated how John allowed his dogs to run freely on the beach and attack people. Greg had confronted John several times about how aggressive his dogs were, and how they'd bitten people just trying to walk along the beach. Eventually, Greg had had enough, and he threatened to poison the dogs if John didn't do anything to control them. Shortly after this, John's dogs were poisoned. Since this happened so soon after the confrontation with Greg, John felt that only one person could be responsible. When someone says they're going to poison your dogs, and the following day your dogs get poisoned, I don't think there's too many people that wouldn't have a thought in their mind about killing that person. The very next day, Greg Fall was found dead with a gunshot wound to the head. And thus, John became the prime suspect in Greg Fall's murder and went on the run. John so McAfee. Breaking news from Belize. John McAfee, who's been on the John McAfee the is a person of interest. An American tech mogul at the center of an international murder mystery. Tonight, McAfee is being hunted for questioning in the murder of his neighbor. But of course, John had a very different story. Let me make this perfectly clear. I had nothing to do with the murder of Gregory Fall. John claimed that in fact, he had hacked the Belize government and had proof of intense corruption. As a result, the Belize government had been trying to kill him, but shot his neighbor by mistake. And that's why John fled. He's dead, yeah, they, they killed him. Um, so it, it's, it, 
me out when I heard that. Oh my God, they were coming for me. They were sticking for me. They got the wrong house. Now, where this gets even messier is that in 2016, Showtime released a documentary about this called Gringo, The Dangerous Life of John McAfee. And in that, several former employees of John's gave interviews where they openly talk about John paying for hitmen and make it seem pretty clear cut that John was responsible for the murder of Greg Fall. But after this, some of those exact same employees appeared on John McAfee's YouTube channel, saying that Showtime had paid them to say those statements and that they were untrue. So now those same people were claiming John was innocent. He would never, ever hire or kill someone. Of course, John could be paying them. And either way, they're clearly unreliable sources if they're willing to claim two entirely different stories. So it's all a little blurry. And even John's girlfriend at the time wasn't sure. When anyone asks me, do you think John killed his neighbor? My response is, I don't know. So whilst it's all extremely suspicious, there were never any charges. So we can't say definitively what happened the night of Greg Fall's murder. What we do know is that as soon as John heard that the police wanted to question him as a suspect in Greg's death, he immediately went on the run. It was time for him to leave Belize and never look back. John McAfee is a wanted man. The one Silicon Valley golden boy is now in hiding somewhere in Central America. John was very deliberate in his efforts to avoid the police. He started wearing disguises, dyed his hair, and dressed like an old man. He'd walk around with a walking stick and even pretend he'd had a stroke. But instead of going on the run in secret, John immediately invited two reporters from Vice News to be with him while he was on the run. He felt this would help him get his side of the story across and maybe provide some extra protection. He also just thought it would be entertaining content. And sure enough, this footage would later become the Netflix documentary called Running With The Devil, The Wild World of John McAfee. John explained to the reporters his view that this was all one big setup by the Belizean government to put him in jail and assassinate him. And so after hiding in a sand bunker for hours, John managed to escape to the neighboring country of Guatemala by illegally crossing the border by boat. Once he was out of Belize, John thought he was gonna be safe. But then something quite ridiculous happened. The reporters from Vice he'd invited to join him on the run uploaded their interview with John to the internet. However, this included a photo they'd taken which contained their exact GPS location in the metadata. Metadata gives the file authenticity, but a part of that metadata is also geolocations. The geodata was on the image and they gave our, our GPS coordinates. So John was supposed to be hiding in Guatemala, and yet now the entire world knew the exact coordinates of where he was. It didn't take long for the authorities to find him. In fact, all kinds of people showed up. Guys with submachine guns, the literal equivalent of the FBI. Here's Interpol, here's a guy with a DEA jacket on. John was surrounded, and so he did what anyone would do in that situation. He, uh, started playing the flute? Since the Vice reporters were there with John, they captured video footage of his arrest. John, where are you going? Benny? To jail. <laughs> Since John was in Guatemala illegally, Interpol wanted to send John back to Belize for questioning about Greg's death. However, John's lawyer informed him that he could file an appeal at 3 p.m. That was hours away, so John somehow needed to buy a little more time. So John faked a heart attack. You faked the heart attack. Sure, I faked it. What would you have done? John was rushed to hospital, and then once 3 p.m. rolled around, John suddenly said he was feeling much better. But because the appeal was now filed, they couldn't just send him back to Belize. So Guatemalan authorities deported him back to the United States instead, which is exactly what John wanted. Just like that, John McAfee was a free man. He was still wanted in Belize for questioning, but since he hadn't been officially charged with any crime, he was able to live his life normally back in the US. Which led some to question, had John McAfee just gotten away with murder? 
Hey guys, I know some of you have been asking when my YouTube course will be ready. It's been in the works for about a year now, as I wanted to make sure it's the best on the market by far. And the good news is, it's now in the final stages. So if you're interested in learning everything I know about writing videos, editing videos, growing a channel, building a team, and how to make lots of money from it, then just click the course link in the description below. Once John McAfee was sent back to the USA in December of 2012, it didn't take long for him to settle into his new life. On literally his first day back in Miami, he met a prostitute 38 years younger than him who would soon become his third wife. He then started his own YouTube channel, and his very first upload was called How to Uninstall McAfee Antivirus. In the video, he shows himself surrounded by women, snorting bath salts, and just generally acting like a madman. This was meant to be a parody of what the media was making him out to be, but many would argue it was pretty accurate. 15 years ago, I had some beautiful software and they took it over. I don't know what they did. It was like the time I hired that Bangkok prostitute to do my taxes while I fucked my accountant. It was terrible. It was clear John still had a talent for manipulating the media and getting attention. He soon started getting lots of news coverage as a security expert, where he warned of the cyber threats the US was facing. In fact, when you googled him, you no longer saw that he was suspected of murder. He had successfully rebranded himself, and he even grew a decent following on Twitter. His fans loved his bold opinions and wild takes. He became so popular, in fact, that in 2016, John McAfee decided to run for president of the United States. Is it official? Are you running for president? Have you filed the papers to run for president? I filed the papers on Tuesday. Uh, I'm officially running, yes ma'am. Then in 2017, John started promoting cryptocurrencies as a way to avoid paying tax. He would promote an altcoin on his Twitter, and then once people invested and the price went up, he'd cash out. It was a pump and dump scheme, and according to the Department of Justice, John personally made over $2 million from this. Shortly after, Greg Fall's family sued John McAfee for his wrongful death. Technically, John was still wanted for questioning in Belize about Greg's death, but because John had fled the country, the criminal charges against him weren't pursued. So now Greg Fall's family was seeking civil action using the American court system. However, John never responded or showed up to court. This meant that the judge decided he should pay $25 million in damages by default. John publicly responded on his Twitter to say that he had been sued dozens of times and owes well over $200 million in total, but he claimed he didn't have any money to give them. In reality, John was still a multi-millionaire, but he was hiding his money in shell companies. And eventually, this would all catch up with John when he picked a battle he couldn't win, the IRS. You see, John had publicly stated that he hadn't paid any taxes in eight years. Firstly, he claimed he simply hadn't made any income, and then he also said it was for ideological reasons, as he'd already paid tens of millions in taxes already and felt he received nothing in return. I have not paid taxes for eight years. I've made no secret of it. I have not filed returns. Every year I tell the IRS, I'm not filing a return. I have no intention of doing so. Go and find me. Of course, this couldn't last forever without facing the consequences. Before we get to the next chapter, I want to help you save time and money with today's video sponsor, ShipStation. ShipStation integrates everywhere you sell online, including Amazon, Etsy, eBay, Shopify, and more. ShipStation then makes it easy to automate shipping tasks and manage your business's orders in one simple dashboard. You can print shipping labels, compare rates, organize every shipment, and automate delivery notifications. And when you use ShipStation, you get discounts up to 89% off USPS and UPS rates. So as your business grows, you could be saving thousands on shipping costs. ShipStation has been a big supporter of Magnates Media for a while now, and I know a lot of you guys have already started using it and been saving money on all your shipments. However, if you've been on the fence about joining, now is the perfect time to check ShipStation out, as you can get a 30-day free trial if you use my link in the description. No matter where you sell or how you ship, make this year your most profitable one yet with ShipStation. Go to ShipStation.com Magnates to sign up for your free 30 day trial today. That's shipstation.com slash magnates. In 2020, John fled from the United States again, this time because the IRS was pursuing him for not paying his taxes. 
He got on board a yacht that he'd bought from the Wolf of Wall Street, filled it with guns, alcohol and drugs, and set sail. He was once again on the run, but this time from American authorities. However, that didn't stop him from running a campaign for the 2020 US presidency. They want to silence me. I will not allow that. I am running my campaign in exile on this boat for the duration. For almost two years, John sailed around the world. Once again, he wore various disguises, although he would randomly just tell people who he was and even take selfies with them. John McAfee, I use you for my, um... Yes, for your antivirus, yes, ma'am. But on October 6th, 2020, John was found and arrested by authorities in Spain. In video footage of him in jail, John tried to explain his way out of the situation by claiming he had insider knowledge about corruption in the IRS. However, in June 2021, the Spanish National Court approved his extradition back to America to face his tax evasion charges. John was 75 at this point and knew he would spend the rest of his life in jail. And so, just hours later, John hanged himself in his prison cell. Computer software entrepreneur John McAfee has been found dead in a prison in Barcelona. Just hours earlier, a Spanish court agreed to extradite him to the United States to face tax evasion charges. However, even though it was confirmed as a suicide in the autopsy, John's wife Janice claims that he would never have taken his own life and instead blamed US authorities for his death. John McAfee was not suicidal. I spoke with him a few hours before he was found dead. This sparked theories that John had been murdered, especially because two years before his death, John posted on Twitter, if I suicide myself, I didn't. I was whacked. He even got a tattoo that said whacked and started a cryptocurrency with the same name. On top of that, after his death, there was a post on his Instagram account with simply the letter Q. Soon after, the account was deleted, sparking even more conspiracy theories. And in yet another twist, in the Netflix documentary released after his death, one of John's ex-girlfriends claimed he paid people to fake his death and is actually still alive. Although there is no evidence of this at all. The documentary also had another big claim though, as there's a recording of John saying that when he was younger, he got sick of his father's abuse and did something about it. Suggesting John killed his own father and just made it look like a suicide. And this is the problem. There are so many wild claims and theories about John that establishing what's true is difficult. If all the allegations against John are true, he is responsible for the death of at least three different people and was an incredibly dangerous and violent man. But on the other hand, none of these were proven and many believe John was set up and is actually a hero for trying to expose corruption. By the end of May, I had every computer wired in the government and I'm listening. I'm in your office. I'm hearing everything you're saying. They didn't anticipate, they forgot who I was. I can get inside your computer and screw with you. And so that's what I did. But did John actually have all these documents of corruption that he claimed? John had promised that if he died, there was a dead man switch, where all the terabytes of damning information he had on government corruption would be released. But so far at least, nothing has come out. Now on this channel, I never try to take sides and instead just present the information. And with this story, I highly recommend looking into it more yourself to draw your own conclusions. All I will say is that I think it's clear John was extremely smart, but he was also definitely paranoid and regularly using drugs. It's also clear he was good at manipulating the media, which only makes it even harder to figure out the truth. What's undeniable is that there are very few people with a life as insane as John McAfee, and so we really can't be surprised that even after his death, he's left behind a legacy of chaos. As for McAfee's company, it was purchased by Intel in 2011 for 7.6 billion and is now valued at around 14 billion. It continues to be one of the most popular antivirus softwares and is still used by millions of people to this very day. Now, if you enjoyed this story, there is one specific video I recommend you watch next, which is the insane true story of the world's biggest online black market, Silk Road, aka the most illegal business in the world. Just like McAfee, this story is so bizarre it feels like a Hollywood movie. So just click here to check it out now and I'll see you there. Cheers.